I'm going to talk about two technologies that work really well together. Before I get started, we had a session on EF Core yesterday, so hopefully you were able to see that. I'm going to talk a little bit about GraphQL now. GraphQL is a query language for APIs, but what's unique about it is it's not just describing how you query those APIs, it's actually a runtime to fulfill APIs as well, which makes it very powerful. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. It's focused on front-end to back-end communication. So it's not something that you would consider to replace something like gRPC, for example. It's not meant for back-channel communication for microservices, but it's designed specifically for that front-end clients, web, et cetera, talking to the back-end. Now, having said that, it operates over modern web protocols. It's strongly typed and discoverable. So this is very powerful. With a GraphQL endpoint, you can discover what types and schemas it supports. The client has full control over the shape of the data, and we're going to see what that means in a second. And it also provides support for real time. So you can pull and query and use those open data connections to get real time dashboards. Now, I'm often asked how GraphQL compares to OData. And it's not really a question of which one is better than the other. They're different use cases. And this table shows you sort of how they compare. One of the powerful features of GraphQL is the ability to shape your object graph down as many levels deep as you want to. OData has support for projections, but it's not as rich as the GraphQL support. Some other things that stand out is the ability to build what's called resolvers which describe how to satisfy requests from the front end. This is huge because instead of just passing off a queryable chain to the back end, what this is doing is giving you full control over different parts of the query. You might have multiple sources that it's pulling from, and it'll go out to those different sources. Finally, for platform specific, OData, to be clear, can be used from any platform. It's an open specification but it's really used heavily in the .NET ecosystem. GraphQL sort of grew up in the more broad ecosystem, but it does have first-class .NET support, which I'm going to show you today. And what's great about it is it integrates directly with Entity Framework Core. So let's talk about why you would even want to consider using GraphQL. If you already have REST endpoints and you've got a working system, why would you consider making the shift or maybe for your next application you're building? So it provides a single endpoint. A lot of developers modernizing their applications are using this to get rid of the idea of service discovery and figuring out which endpoint to go to, to which service, and basically providing a single endpoint that fans out to all the other services. It's very discoverable, so there's a standard way of inquiring on the schema and the types that come with it. You can avoid overfetching data. We're going to see that in a demo. Minimize round trips, reduce need to worry about versioning the API because your client is just asking for what it needs. So if you add new properties, there's no need to update the client. There's this powerful feature called schema stitching that allows you to take existing GraphQL endpoints and combine them. Now, a perfect example, these don't have to be endpoints you control. So there might be a public API for weather and another public API for restaurants. You could schema stitch those and provide an API that says, give me the restaurants where the weather's going to be good for outside seating, for example. And finally, a use case we see a lot is as a facade to back-end services. So people are taking legacy WCF and other types of protocols, putting them behind resolvers and GraphQL, and using that to have a modern set of APIs as they move forward. So let's stop talking about GraphQL and get into a demo. And what I'm showing you here is something called the Messier catalog. So I have a new hobby of astrophotography. All of these are pictures I've taken myself. And in the late 1700s, someone named Charles Messier was a comet hunter. And he kept coming across images he thought were comets. They had very low power telescopes. But it turned out to be a cluster or a nebula or something else. So he set out to catalog these so that he would avoid double booking them, if you will, or confusing them for comets. Now, it turns out a lot of these targets are very beautiful targets. I've set out to photograph the entire catalog, 
So I put it into a SQLite database, and here you can see I've got question marks for the ones that I haven't cataloged. Now this is a simple, minimal API application. In fact, the entire application fits on just over a page, and I'll walk you through it really quickly. We're basically setting up a, uh, we don't want to be in the database loader. That's actually my configuration. Let's go to program here. We're basically setting up a DB context factory so that we can get these contexts that talk to the database. We're setting up these endpoints of Messier and Messier with the ID, and we're just returning that query from EF Core. So if I come back to my web and I hit the, let's uh, refresh this for a second, and then if I hit the endpoint, of Messier, you'll see I get a ton of JSON data back. And this is part of the problem because I'm not really using all of this data. If you recall from what I showed, I basically had an image and a title, and that's pretty much it. But I'm getting the entire record back, which includes some embedded images, and I know there's inherent risks with those that simplified the demo. But if we look at the uh, code again, you can see that my database command is actually pulling back all of the properties from the database, even though I don't need them. Now, there's different ways that you can address this. I want to address it using GraphQL. So I've taken the very first step, which is adding the references. Now, there are several GraphQL clients for .NET. They all work well with Entity Framework. I'm choosing to use Hot Chocolate as the client for this demo, and that's what I'm showing here. Now let's get Hot Chocolate wired in. Let's see what it takes to do. The first thing I'm going to do is add something that, if you're familiar with Entity Framework, is like a DB context. It's basically a class that tells GraphQL what is interesting and what we're querying. So I'm going to call this query. And then I'm going to expose a method, iQueryable. Actually, let me do this to save some typing. I've got my cheat sheet here. And I'm just going to grab this class really quickly. And all this class does is, is it, it's exposing a footprint, the shape of the data, basically. So if we paste that there, wrong paste. Let's try that again. Control C. I've literally reduced this to the easiest programming. There we go, right there. So what I'm doing is actually just doing an empty list, so we're not going to expect any data, but we're going to fix that in a second. And let me get rid of this outer class. See, when cut and paste goes wrong, you can have this cascading issue, but we're going to fix that right up. And then the other piece is actually adding GraphQL to my middleware. Now, with minimal API, that is pretty easy up here. I'm going to do, 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 do app use GraphQL. Actually, let me grab this again. Builder. I need to use my builder. So this is the simple command. After we've built the app, da, 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 let me go. I was getting ahead of myself. So we added the DB context factory here. I'm adding, this is a turn in silly fast. Hold on. I know I can cut and paste. I've practiced this, I promise. All right, so what we're doing is we're adding a GraphQL server, and then we're telling it what types it supports, which happens to be one type, which is a query. The only other thing I need to do is I need to tell it how to get to that GraphQL endpoint. So what I'm going to do is use routing. That's the first piece. And then as part of routing, I'm going to tell it to use endpoints. And for the endpoints, I'm going to map GraphQL. And I'm going to give it the very creative endpoint of slash GraphQL. So there you have it. I've added the reference. I've set up the server, set up the type, and used the endpoints. So we're going to go ahead and F5 that. And I'll use my common trick of a clockwise mouse to speed things up. And we're loading the catalog, but what I want to do is go to this GraphQL endpoint. So what this has done for me is it's provided me with this in-browser experience 
that's called banana pop cake. It's part of hot chocolate and it's a way that I can interact with the query. So I can come here, go to schema reference, and I can drill into the details of what it looks like. And just by adding those few lines of codes, it's deduced all of the properties from my classes, and it's allowing me to drill down as deep as I want to go. Now, if I actually run a query right now, nothing's going to happen because I haven't wired anything up. So let's fix that piece. I'm going to come back here, and again, to save time, I'm going to grab a little piece of code. So the first thing I'm doing is GraphQL just needs a context. I've configured a DB context factory right here with logging. I'm just going to use that same factory to configure an instance of a DB context. So if anything says, hey, I need this context from dependency injection, this is going to go out to the factory, say, give me your configured context and hand me off a copy. That's all that line of code does. The next thing I'm going to do is update the query itself to use that context. So we'll go back into the query definition right here. And we're going to replace this class with this. And I'm going to use my magic control period to pull in the usings that I need. And we'll get the service right here. And we'll get the context right here. So let me explain what's happening. I'm exposing that same get targets, and I'm telling it to use dependency injection to give me the context. I'm just returning what Entity Framework Core passes off. This is why these two are so tightly integrated, is I don't have to do anything else. These attributes tell Hot Chocolate to stand up additional information about filters and sorting. So EF Core is capable of doing this, but the schema by itself is just the shape of the data. This adds extra so that we can project and sort, et cetera. The only other step that we'll do before we go live with this is to take the middleware definition and add those pieces to the middleware. So it's an opt-in model. It's completely configurable. And when we come to this piece of code right here, we're telling it to go ahead and add those services in, projections, filtering, and sorting. So let's go ahead and run that. Spin it up, and it compiles, so we're ready to ship to production. And I'm going to go back to my GraphQL endpoint. And now I'm going to actually create an operation. So let's see what that looks like. Right now, I'm just saying targets and NGC designation. That's a descriptor for the target. If I click Run, you can see in my response over here that I'm getting back just the pieces of data that I requested. Now, here's what's important. Don't be confused. I'm not pulling back the entire database and grabbing everything. If we look at our running code, you can see here I'm only getting the property that I asked for. This is the power of this because the client side can change the shape of that data, and there's no modification to the server side. So let's stop this, and what I'm going to do is change my client to use the GraphQL tool. Now, if we look at what the client looks like right here, I've got a simple HTML file. I don't want people to be too shocked. I'm not using Angular or React or any framework. I'm just using vanilla JavaScript. And what that JavaScript was doing was it was going to this REST endpoint, iterating the results, and just building up divs that had the information from the results. So what I want to do now is replace that for a GraphQL request. Let's see what that request looks like. So I'm going to grab this block of code. I'm going to paste it back here just inside my script tag. And don't worry if you're not familiar with JavaScript. I just want to show some of the simple differences. So the main code that's building the divs looks almost exactly the same. It's just iterating through a JSON object. How we get to that object is a little bit different. So you can see here that I'm going to my GraphQL endpoint, and I'm doing a post. By default, GraphQL takes a post, but that post can ask for a query. It can ask for an update. It can ask for multiple batched operations, so it has a lot of capabilities. Now, the shape of the data I'm asking for is just the ID, the thumbnail, the index, and the designation. So let's go ahead and run this. 
and see if we can actually render a new screen using GraphQL instead of REST. So it's loading, and here we have the targets coming in. Now I want to point out that we still have some of these targets that I haven't captured yet. And these are also coming in a random order. It's just coming in the order that they're in my SQLite database. So I want to do two things. Actually, I want to do three things. I want to address the ordering. I want to filter to just the images that are doing something interesting. And I may want to asynchronously load my images in case there's a lot of images. So let's look at what that shape of uh, change is like. Now, the other thing that I will point out before I do that is here we're getting ID, thumbnail, index, and NGC. So again, I changed the way the client requested the data. It passed through to EF Core, and the database is actually just fetching the fields we need. This is the overfetching piece of that. So let's stop this and add one more block of code here. So the first thing I'm going to do is just embed an image that's a loading image. And I'm just going to put that as a template right up here. And that is just the loading icon. You'll see that in a second. The next thing I'm going to do is grab the code. And I'm going to walk through exactly what the code does. And then we'll see it in action. So it's a little bit more code to provide our optimizations. We'll come down here. And we're going to grab the inside of this script. And let's take a look at what this code is doing. So the first thing it's doing is in the query, I'm adding this new where clause. So we use the GraphQL format to actually specify the filter, the ordering, the projections that we want. So in this request, I'm asking it to in starts with means doesn't start with, not starts with. So I'm eliminating everything that starts with the signature of the ones that have the question marks. I only want the interesting ones. The other thing I'm doing is ordering the data. And again, if I was using a REST API and I wasn't using OData, which provides these capabilities, I would have to overload parameters or query strings or change the way that the server was designed in order to support these features. Here, I can just change the request on the client, and I'm pretty much good to go. And then I'm just grabbing the index, the ID, and the designation. So I'm not even grabbing the image yet. So what it'll do is it'll come out and it'll render these divs. And notice that I'm using this data source attribute. That's just storing the ID for later. Because then I can come back and use that data source to do a second post. And this post is asking it just for that single ID and just grabbing that thumbnail. All right, so basically, just to recap, I'm requesting a different shape of data, filtering, sorting, and then I'm asynchronously going back and requesting the images. Let's see how that works. Fingers crossed. Demos are in alignment. And there we have the loading, and boom, it happened pretty quickly. But what you saw was the loading icons, and then the images came in and loaded later. In fact, if we look at the code behind the code, so to speak, you can see here we'll have a lot of selects with this thumbnail because it was selecting individually for every single image. Also notice that these are sorted in the proper order, and these are the images that I've captured so far. So I've got my work set out because there's 110 different images in that catalog, but I think I'll be able to fill the gaps for those. Now, what I've been showing you is just a JavaScript client for that. And there's a lot of different clients. This, uh, because it grew up in the ecosystem sort of outside of .NET specific, there's Angular, there's React. There's other ways that you can wire up a client for this. However, I want to point out, and I don't have time to demo it today, but there are clients for .NET as well. So for example, if you're using Blazor Wasm, or if you're using WPF or WinForms, you can use a client that takes that same strongly typed schema and basically generates a using either runtime or development time or whatever the code necessary to connect to the client. And we've done that actually for our EF Core contributions. We have a query that goes out to GitHub, which uses GraphQL, 
and pulls back contributions and generates the markdown for those contributions. So we have that. The other thing I wanted to point out is I'm sort of doing what we would call a manual defer. And by that, I mean I'm controlling the asynchronous loading of the images. There is a feature of GraphQL, again, it's a little more involved to get into in this short segment that we have. But what that feature does is it allows you to specify portions of your requests that are asynchronous. And those can be asynchronously resolved on the back end. So with one request, I can tell it, bring back this data, asynchronously fetch the other data, and satisfy that request, which is a very, very powerful capability. So again, I wanted to point out that there are multiple clients. I'm going to give you the links to the do, do, do. The client that I use, this is Hot Chocolate. I'm also giving you the links to the Entity Framework Core documentation so that you have both. And the power of using strongly typed queries and giving your front end complete control over what it receives from the back end is really the benefit we see people receiving from GraphQL. Having said that, that's what I came here to show you. I would love to answer any questions that you might have or drill into other details in the time we have left. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was so cool. I have questions, so I'm going to launch in on my own. But okay. um, <laughs> uh, So remember, guys, submit uh, questions on Twitter with hashtag .net conf. Uh, you can submit them as soon as you think of them because we're a little bit delayed in actually getting them on the screen. But I did see in chat some people love the name Hot Chocolate. <laughs> um, it's just a super cozy name for it. Um, so can I, this is my question for you. Can I grab your EF query that you're using to get your GitHub contributors? Because we're doing the same thing for Rosalind, but I think like Nika and Jinu and Cyrus are like figuring it out manually. Sure, absolutely. I would love and that. <laughs> what's awesome is, so you talk about the fun name like hot chocolate, right? So Strawberry Shortcake is the name of the client for C Sharp. And what you can do is because GraphQL strongly typed, what I did was pointed at the GitHub endpoint it gave me a schema that gave me everything available for that. Then I wrote my own schema definition that said, I'm just interested in labels and contributors and these pieces. It generated a client that had strongly typed C-sharp classes, and then it looks just like an HTTP client request. I basically asynchronously say, give me the contributors. It gives me a list of classes that I iterate over, and then I generate markdown, and I'm good to go. That's exactly what we need. Do you have Markdown to WordPress? Because that's what our blog's <laughs> going to be in. I use our engine to go to the, the WordPress. I haven't written that part myself. Nice. So. I shouldn't be making feature requests already. <laughs> that's, that's the horrible thing. You give a PM a link to a tool, and now I have things that I need out of it. There you go. Very cool. Um, so I'm actually trying to remember, are there um, sort of EF Core, .NET 6 blogs or documentation that people should check out? Any like performance improvements or stuff that we want to call out that's specific? There is a ton, and it's uh, unfortunate, a little bit longer than I'd like the link to be. But if you go to <laughs> aka.ms slash what's new dash EFCore 6, you will get to the documentation of everything that's new in EFCore 6. And there's a ton of capabilities and features, whether it's additional support for the Cosmos DB provider, whether it's our temporal tables, we've got compiled models. And you mentioned performance. We have a blog that covers all of these performance improvements that we've built into the tool, and they're very significant. Wow, very, very cool. OK, we've got some Twitter updates here. Um, some people I wanted to look at. Oh, yes, so it looks like Jeremy isn't thinking about Azure Cosmos DB. He's taking pictures of the actual Cosmos. You worked <laughs> your hobby right into the demo. I did, absolutely. It's uh, been a very rewarding hobby. And actually, Cosmos DB is the right uh, backend actually for that. I use SQLite, so it was a nice self-contained demo. But a document database is where to store the images. So. Very cool. Are those huge images, by the way? Did you talk a little bit about yeah the the yeah? So I I did the thumbnail version for this demo, which is uh, just 256 pixel images. But the main images are usually between 200 to one gigabyte in size before oh processing. Oh my gosh! So. A single image. A single image. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to talk about that, but we've got some more <laughs> things. Um, so. 
uh, where are filters and sorts performed in this? Where is the actual compute happening? So that's the, the beauty of GraphQL is that your resolvers are really what determine happens there. So in the case of EF Core, what Hot Chocolate is doing is it's taking those filters and sorts, passing it through the coreable pipeline to EF Core and letting our providers figure it out. So whether you're using Cosmos DB or Postgres or MySQL or SQL Server or Azure SQL, it's going to create the dialect for that database and pass it off. So your filters and sorting are actually happening in the database where it's most efficient. Let's say you had a legacy backend uh, endpoint that didn't support filtering or sorting. You could write a resolver that pulled back that data, did some in-memory filtering and sorting, filtering and sorting, and then return that to the client and make it completely transparent. Okay, so wherever your database is running is where the actual compute for that is going to be. Abs so yes. cool. I'm glad, you know, the database which knows what it's doing is the right. one that's doing that. It's not us with our .NET code on top of it and <laughs> inside of our client or whatever. You, you'll take care of it for us. Yes. Very cool. Okay, so how about mutations with EF6 and GraphQL? So mutations do work. Mutations are a little bit more complex, but there is, if you go to the hot chocolate site itself that I linked, there is a subsection specifically for NID Framework that walks through that. But it does the full support. Basically what EF Core can do, GraphQL with mutations can do as well. Very cool. Okay, I think I got a bit of a spicy one. How about, I don't see the point of GraphQL. When, when you, can, you can basically achieve the same and more with gRPC with protobuf field masks. Comments. I, I agree. <laughs> if you're happy with what you're doing, there's no reason to switch. If you're building a front end that requires that flexibility of shaping the data without updating the back end and you want to take advantage of that, it's a very viable solution. Very cool. So depends on what you're using it for. Exactly. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, it's not designed for back end to back end communication. It really is designed for that front end to back end communication. GRPC. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Totally cool. Well, we've got some comments just in general. What is it? .NET Conf is like Christmas, but for .NET developers. <laughs> nice. Love that. Just lots of general um, interest in the chat. Let's see if there's anything I haven't. Um, oh, yeah. Is there a default scaffolding in Visual Studio for GraphQL and Web API? There is not a default scaffolding. So right now, uh, I mentioned there's open source clients. So we have GraphQL.net. There is an EF Core GraphQL. And there is uh, Hot Chocolate are the three main libraries, and they all do things a little bit differently. So we leave that up to the choice for the developer. But we may look at providing like samples, tools, templates, things to make life easier for that. Awesome. So no like EF.NET 6 templates baked into the CLI? Because those show up in Visual Studio nowadays. That will be cool. Templates is, is on we'll the list them. to do, but nothing right now. Okay. So. It's on the burn down. Really good to hear. Well, right. thank you so much, Jeremy. This is absolutely amazing.